Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the IEA King Cole Center. My name is Benedicta and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website www.iea-cole.org. Residents of member countries and employees of our sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration. The subject for today's webinar is Potential Market for High Efficiency and Low Emissions Heli Coal-Fired Technologies, presented by Dr. Stephen Mills. Please take it away, Steve. Thank you, Benedicte. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to this month's webinar from the IE Clean Coal Centre. Today, we'll be looking at Heli Technologies. Now, today's webinar is based on the findings of a new centre report that will be published shortly. In the first part of the webinar, we'll take a brief look at some of the background to Heli Technologies and the advantages they can provide, and talk a bit about why, despite a reduction in coal power generation in some parts of the world, on a global basis, it's not going away anytime soon. After, I thought it might be interesting to dip into the case studies that formed the bulk of the report, looking at ongoing developments in some of the larger economies, but also what's going on in some of the smaller emerging nations. For very sound reasons, there are potential markets for heli-based technologies in many of these. Now, these are the main systems considered in the report. Now, clearly, we, we don't have time to go into the technology behind each of these in any real detail today. But if you want any more information, we have a wealth of reports and other material freely available on our website that I direct you to. So we, we examined a widespread of different countries that either use coal already or are actively considering doing so. And these were some of the factors they considered to be important. Many of these countries cited reasons that range from improving their security of energy supply, diversifying their energy mix, or, or simply providing electricity to populations who are in need of a reliable, affordable supply. Various coal-based generating technologies are now available, and some are better suited to meet the specific requirements of a particular country. So, for example, a developing economy is likely to adopt a different approach to a more developed nation. For instance, in reality, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. But looking to the future, many economies will continue to rely on coal for at least some of their electricity, although understandably as different countries and regions are at different stages in their respective development, a number of approaches are being adopted. Now, although recent times have seen a strong push towards the greater use of renewables for power generation, and depending on where you are, natural gas and nuclear power, coal still generates around 38% of the world's electricity. And there's little doubt it will remain an important and integral part of the global energy mix well into the future. Largely because of this, there's therefore a pressing need to make sure that it's used in the cleanest and most efficient manner possible. And this is where modern heli technologies have a vital role to play. Compared to older coal-based systems that relied on subcritical steam conditions, Modern heli-based power plants have a number of key advantages in that they're of much higher efficiency, they're cleaner, and they can operate more flexibly. They're also better suited using state-of-the-art emission control systems, meaning that some plants now produce emissions that are on a par with those of natural gas plants. And factors such as these shown here have made them an attractive proposition in many economies. So we've looked at the global status and deployment of heli technologies in a number of our recent reports. And although they're being used increasingly in different parts of the world, Asia remains the main focus of activity. The bulk of new coal-fired power generation to be built in the immediate future will be in Asia. And many of these plans, plans <clears throat> plan to be either using supercritical or ultra supercritical conditions. So that's a positive sign. In total, there are at least several hundred gigawatts of new coal plants planned, and many of these developments have been encouraged by positive energy policies and continuing technical advancement. And this doesn't include quite a number of other projects still at earlier stages in their development. It's interesting that a growing number of these are in emerging economies that haven't previously relied heavily on coal, if at all. These include countries such as those shown here, for example. If you combine them all, they represent more than 13% of the planned expansion of the global power fleet. 
Now that brings us to the case studies. So we looked at around 50 countries that currently use coal or where there's a good possibility that they might in the future to see what their plans were with respect to coal's future use and where this was a real possibility, the type and scale of any such developments. So selected countries were assessed largely on the scale of coal-based generating capacity proposed or in development that was considered to have a reasonably good chance of reaching commercial operation. Each study was tailored to reflect the scale and type of the developments going on. So for instance, in the case of the biggest market, China, the study looks at issues such as these. Now clearly the coverage was more limited for smaller and developing countries, but each reflects the individual type and scale of development, developments taking place or proposed. So now we'll take a look at some examples of countries with bigger, medium and smaller scale market possibilities. Now it'll come as no surprise to anyone that China has the biggest, world's biggest economy that relies so heavily on coal. It's as the biggest, I'll spend a little more time on it. Now we've examined the situation regarding coal-fired power in China in a number of recent reports and blogs. And as I mentioned, these are available on our website. If you take a look at these, I'll help you, help you uh, get a clearer picture of some of the very interesting and innovative coal-based activities taking place there. Now, there are many huge numbers bandied about, but in the last year or so, China was responsible for no less than 46% of global coal production and 51% of coal demand, 48% of coal-fired power plant capacity and 20% of the seaborne thermal coal trade. Now, as we're all well aware, the pace of China has been changing dramatically and the energy sector has played a major part in this transformation. It has a vital role in terms of supporting sustainable development, economic growth and energy security. And as part of this, Chinese technology developers and other organizations are actively engaged in developing several heli technologies even further. Now in 2019, China added 25.5 gigawatts to its coal power fleet. Now to put this into perspective, this addition equated to the current capacity of the entire EU coal fleet. By the end of the year, the country had no less than 1,030 gigawatts of coal-fired power plants in operation. Coal share in the energy mix was just under 58%, so critically important to the country's economy. Now, the power sector consists of, consists of a mix of different coal plants, but the current approach being adopted is to build large capacity units, often with very effective emission control systems, mainly consisting of 660 and 1,000 megawatt ultra supercritical units. China now hosts some of the biggest and most efficient coal plants in the world, and this is just one example shown here. Now, in the first quarter of this year, China had nearly 100 gigawatts of coal power capacity in development, with a further 106 more in the planning pipeline. And this accounted for no less than 40% of global, global, global capacity planned or being built. Efforts to improve the efficiency and reduce environmental impact hasn't been limited to larger capacity plants. Some of the country's nearest subcritical units are the focus of some very interesting innovative programs that are producing significant improvements in their operation and effectiveness. So, overall, the Chinese government's continuing its strict approach to increasing fleet efficiency and is pushing forwards various measures to further reduce emissions from the coal based sector. Even though there's currently a strong push towards renewables, there's little doubt that coal will continue to play a major role in China's economic development much of it centered on some of the world's cleanest and most advanced heli-based power plants. I thought we'd take a look at what's going on in Turkey. This is an example of a major potential market, clearly not as big as China or India, but still of considerable scale and potential. Now, for some years, Turkey's electricity demand has increased steadily, driven largely by population growth and economic development. Around 88% of the country's total energy and nearly 70% of its electricity comes from fossil fuels, mostly from imported oil, gas and coal. Now, in the case of coal, annual imports are usually somewhere in excess of 30 million tonnes. Coal is also the country's main indigenous energy resource. The bulk of this is in the form of lignite, or there are also some fairly sizable deposits of hard coal, and both of these are used widely for power generation. Now, as a means for reducing the country's high energy import dependence, the government's been encouraging the greater use of, use of Turkish coal, is especially for power generation. As a result, production has been rising. In 2018, 
Turkey broke its own production record, managing to produce nearly 102 million tonnes in the year. Now, at the moment, Turkey's power sector, in sector has a, a generating capacity of around 85 gigawatts, and coal plants make up 18.6 of this total, making the country the biggest coal-fired power producer in the Middle East. The sector includes more than 25 coal plants, the biggest of which is 1.44 gigawatts. Now, electricity from coal is important to Turkey's economy. Coal-fired capacity currently makes up around 20% of the total, although coal plants usually generate at least a third of the country's electricity. The remainder is based mainly on natural gas, hydro and other renewables. But overall, Turkey still generates around two-thirds of its electricity from fossil fuels. Roughly half of the coal capacity is currently based on subcritical technology, although there's also a further five gigawatts of newer plants that are supercritical. And the country now also has one ultra supercritical plant in operation that came online in 2017. As with many other projects elsewhere, China was heavily involved in its design and construction. Now, Turkey has a significant number of coal fired power projects at various stages in their development, and the expansion of the coal power sector is an important part of current government thinking. In fact, Turkey represents the largest potential grouping of new coal-fired power plants outside China and India. As you can see, there are somewhere between 37 and 44 gigawatts of coal-based projects in the pipeline, many of which are slated to fire Turkish lignite, although others will use imported hard coal. There are also other projects at earlier stages in their development, the largest of which is a proposed 5 gigawatt plant in Konya province location of an estimated 1.8 gigatons of lignite. And here, the Turkish Ministry of Energy has been recruiting investors to build what would be one of the world's biggest coal plants. Now, reportedly all major new plants will make the most of the latest technical and environmental advances available. So, coal is important to Turkey, and for a long time there have been concerns about the country's high dependence on imported energy, security of supply, and of course cost. And for reasons such as these, the government's introduced a national energy policy to promote the greater use of indigenous sources of any, particularly hard coal and lignite in this case, for power generation, and both are considered to be highly strategic resources. There's an overarching aim for two-thirds of Turkey's energy consumption to eventually be met from domestic sources, and it seems that coal-fired heli plants are likely to play an important part in the country's future economic development. Let's move on to Pakistan. Well, for some years, Pakistan's become increasingly short of electricity and it's suffered regular shortfalls, outages and load shedding of up to 10 hours a day. Not surprisingly, this has hampered economic and social development. And although there's a goal of providing universal access to electricity, many millions still lack a reliable supply. Power sector inefficiencies have cost the economy billions of dollars every year. In order to meet this increasing electricity demand in escape from load shedding, there's been a growing focus on the development of coal-fired power plants. Having considered the alternative, the government identified coal as one of the most cost-effective options. The country's short of gas, hydro capacity is limited, and imported oil and energy are expensive. So increasingly, coal's been replacing both oil and LNG. And this has so far saved the country a lot of money by reducing import requirements. Pakistan's coal resource potential is estimated to be around 186 gigatons, 175 of which are located in Tar, thought to be one of the world's largest lignite deposits. The government considers Tar's coals to be an integral part of Pakistan's long-term energy security strategy and a central part of the country's future energy mix. It views the exploitation of this as vital for driving forward the country's economy, as well as for the provision of affordable, reliable electricity for society in general. Now, before 2016, Pakistan had just a single coal power plant. It now has nine that generate up to a quarter of the country's electricity. And at the moment, there are another four plants being built. Around $35 billion is being committed mainly to build new power plants, coal power plants, and to, and to secure funding for some of these, the government's turned increasingly to China for expertise and finance. In fact, China is investing in 21 energy projects under what's termed the Chinese Pakistan Economic Corridor, a flagship project under the Belt and Road Initiative. 
The majority of this investment has gone into coal. In fact, 70% of the 13.8 gigawatt, gigawatts worth of uh, power projects and operational planned are coal-based. Now, several new major supercritical power plants have come online in the past few years, and I know around another 10 or other important projects are at various stages of development, many of which are opting to use either supercritical or ultra-supercritical. The biggest project currently in the pipeline is a 1.32 gigawatt USC plant that will fire Pakistani tar coal. Now, most projects are scheduled to start construction in the next few years, and most reply to some extent on Chinese funding and construction expertise. Coal is becoming an increasingly important factor in Pakistan's future economic development, with the development of tar coal being a, a key factor of the, a part of the government's long-term energy security strategy. Its use is helping Pakistan to diversify its energy sources, reduce the cost of electricity and overcome its electricity shortfall. The new advanced coal projects being developed will play an important role in the government's plans to increase general access to electricity, to develop new hubs of economic activity and possibly even allow electricity exports. Good news for the country's balance of payments. So coal has become a key component of the country's energy mix and is likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. So we'll move on to Morocco. Well, Morocco is an interesting example of where a smaller country has moved progressively from power plants based on subcritical conditions to supercritical and then to ultra supercritical technology in order to provide electricity to its population. It's one of those countries that has only limited energy resources and so depends heavily on external sources for much of its supply. Indeed, the Moroccan Ministry of Energy reckons that the country meets around 90% or so of its electricity, of its energy uh, needs through imports of oil, coal, gas and electricity. It's the only country in North Africa without significant oil and gas reserves and its long dependence on imported energies had a major impact on public finances and security of supply. This situation prompted the government to embark on a series of power sector reforms, one of which has involved the introduction of coal power. Now, unlike its immediate neighbours, Morocco uses coal to provide a significant part of its electricity. This is now an important part of the country's energy mix and typically provides around a third of Morocco's electricity. The main reasons behind adopting coal, well, it's the usual ones really, it's low cost and easy availability, a, a need to diversify the national energy mix, and a need to improve the overall security of energy supply. Now, Morocco currently has a total generating capacity of around nine gigawatts, and coal-fired plants make about five of this. However, sector capacity is on the rise and is expected to increase to around 25 gigawatts by 2030. Demands being driven up mainly by a combination of economic expansion, growing urban population and increased rural electrification. In fact, access to electricity has increased significantly in recent years. And in 1996, it was only around 18%, but now it's 99%. That's quite an achievement, but it's clearly one that's helped up drive energy demands significantly. Now, turning to the power sector, well, Morocco has five coal-fired power plants. The, the oldest ones are subcritical, although in 2017, a new 350 megawatt supercritical unit came online at the Gerada plant. This was funded, like so many, and built by China. Since then, the new units proved to be very successful and it's helped address power shortages in the eastern part of the country, as well as bolstered economic growth in the region. The Girada unit was followed at the end of 2018 by the 1.38 gigawatt ultra supercritical SAFI plant. This was the first USC plant in, in Africa and it now generates around a quarter of the country's electricity. In operation, it's so far proved to be very clean and efficient. And as with Morocco's other coal plants, it operates mainly on base load. Looking to the future, well, there's the possibility of a second USC plant. There's a 1.32 gigawatt plant that's also been proposed now. Even if this new project doesn't come to fruition, the existing supercritical and ultra supercritical plants are set to continue providing much of the country's electricity for some considerable time. They've helped fulfill the government's goal of improving security of and availability of energy supply and diversify the country's energy mix.
Now, for our last case study, I thought we'd look at the situation in a smaller emerging African nation. Now, there's an immense need for electricity in much of Africa. And although estimates tend to differ, it's likely that up to 640 million Africans lack a reliable, affordable supply of electricity, something we're lucky enough to take for granted. Like many other African nations, Cote d'Ivoire needs more electricity and the need is growing. At the moment, around a third of the population still lack electricity. In situations such as these, just a single clean coal power plant can make a huge difference to people's quality of life. It can help create jobs and it can drive economic growth. So in this case, the authorities are addressing the country's growing energy demand and a major objective is to achieve up to four gigawatts of new capacity in the immediate future. As part of this, a new coal-fired power project is being developed. This is the $800 million Broto Independent Power Project, a 700 megawatt supercritical plant to be located in San Pedro, a port city in southwest Côte d'Ivoire. It'll consist of two 350 megawatt supercritical units firing imported hard coal and will be funded and built by China Power Construction as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. The government's identified the Broto project as one of major importance, critical for the country's future sustained economic development. As a key power source is expected to significantly enhance the, car the country's power supply structure, improve grid stability, as well as provide reliable low cost electricity. By 2030, the plant could be supplying more than a quarter of the country's electricity. And while we're on the subject of smaller scale projects, well, when most people think about newer, clean, high efficiency coal fired power plants, perhaps understandably, large scale projects tend to come to mind. Even given factors such as economies of scale, that's not really that surprising. But not every situation needs a large capacity plant. There are times where electricity demand is more limited, so just a single smaller capacity plant might fit the bill. But even this, as we've just talked about in the context of Cote d'Ivoire, could have a real impact on social and economic development in a particular region. Of course, there are various possibilities, but coal power is often flagged up as an affordable option. And unlike the old days, if, if we can call them that, it no longer needs to be inefficient and polluting. So even a small unit can help meet local needs, but using cleaner and more efficient technology than perhaps a traditional subcritical unit. Now, even if the scale of need is relatively modest, this no longer rules out the use of more advanced coal-based technologies as effective small capacity systems are now available or being developed. Even USC units as small as 315 megawatts have become available. I mean, for example, there's such a, a project underway in, in, in Indonesia based on uh, Japanese technology. And also, well, China has successfully developed supercritical CFBC units, some as small as 300 megawatts. And initiatives are also underway elsewhere, perhaps no more so than in the USA, where the Department of Energy's Coal First program is working on the development of small capacity, advanced coal-based power plants in the range of 50 to 350 megawatts. For example, one design being pursued incorporates a 250 megawatt USC boiler. And this schematic here shows an example of one of the concepts that's being considered. So even though power plants might be small, they can still be vitally important for functions such as grid balancing or especially in developing economies that are desperate for electricity. Now, what have been the main findings of the report? Well, in terms of the choice of technology, well, particularly in the initial stages of project development, it's, it's not uncommon for the choice of technology not to be revealed. But the choice of technology is important. It, it can influence the decision whether a project proceeds in the first place. It can limit financing options. It can impact on the level of local involvement and it can affect the degree of any opposition on environmental grounds. But whatever's decided at the end of the day, there's no one size fits all solution, as I've mentioned. The decisions on the choice of technology will be based on factors that differ between countries. On the environmental front, while well, almost all countries would like to increase their reliance on renewables, but electricity from these can be expensive and irregular, which means that some form of backup is really needed. So alongside these efforts, quite a few countries are also actively developing or considering the addition of coal-fired generation, mainly for baseload or to take up the slack when output from renewables inevitably drops. 
As I've already mentioned several times today, coal-based generation is often viewed as an affordable option when it comes to providing a reliable source of electricity. Of course, compared to traditional subcritical systems, heli-based technologies have a lower environmental impact per unit of electricity generated. Their higher efficiency means that for each unit generated, less coal is needed. And less coal leads, obviously, to lower conventional emissions and CO2. And finally, modern heli plants are capable of operating more flexibly than older systems, meaning they can maintain operating conditions over a wider, wider range of fluctuations. And this helps to avoid spikes in emissions when operating, for instance, under low load. Turning to financing, well, as, as I'm sure everyone will know, globally, fewer organizations are now willing to fund, to fund coal-based projects in general. And this sometimes even extends to heli technologies. But all this although this situation is continuing to evolve, fundings, funding currently remains available from some sources. The largest and most accessible of these are China, Japan and South Korea, although the situation could be changing in both Korea and Japan in the near future. However, it's not uncommon for a proportion of a project's finance to come from a more local domestic source, often topped up with a larger contribution from a major funder such as, funder such as China. Now, how much new heli-based capacity could be developed in the future? Well, as we've heard, the scale of new capacity proposed or in development varies enormously between countries. So in the report, we've looked at around 50 countries to determine what might develop. This was based on their total coal generating capacity proposed or in development that was considered to have at least a reasonable chance of going ahead. Now, clearly the biggest are China and India. Although, although there are many countries where heli-based projects are or are likely to make a useful contribution. This includes countries such as Turkey, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, Zimbabwe, Cambodia, and so on. And each of these individual countries is examined in the report. So to close, there are large parts of the world that are desperately short of electricity. The greater deployment of power generation systems based on heli technologies in particular would help address this need by providing stable, affordable electricity needed for sustainable economic and social development and something that we can take for granted. Remember, I mentioned in Africa alone, up to 640 million people currently lack electricity and globally, the total is more than 1.1 billion, which seems a remarkable number in this day and age. If the right technology is adopted, it can provide clean, affordable electricity that would transform the lives of millions and help bring them out of poverty. It can power hospitals, improve agricultural practices, light schools and homes, and help drive sustainable, meaningful economic development as that has the power to change people's lives. Now, before we end, I just need to speak to you about coronavirus. As you'll all know, there isn't much that hasn't been affected by the ongoing pandemic. And needless to say, the global power sector is just one area where it continues to play havoc. During the course of preparing this report, the pandemic spread across the world, and this has had numerous direct and knock-on effects on the power sector. There's been a major economic and industrial hiatus that's dramatically reduced energy demand, especially in the more, some of the more developed economies. A consequence of this is that there's now a degree of uncertainty over some things. Obviously, some coal-based projects have been affected. In some cases, they've been put on hold or deferred. And depending on how quickly the world's economy recovers, a number of others could potentially be cancelled. Completion dates of many power projects have been pushed back, and construction has been hampered by a lack of access for workers and materials. So at the moment, some projects are going to be affected more by COVID than others. And inevitably, this is impacting on development timelines and so on. Having said that, wherever possible, the data used in the report do still give a good indication of where coal-based capacity is being considered, the scale of its possible deployment, and the types of technologies proposed. Now, before I end the webinar, I'd just like to mention our Knowledge Partners Network. The Clean Coal Centre plays an active role in an extensive range of network of organisations are involved in work that's relevant to our own. This informal association means that we can all share information and results, especially on the best means for reducing the environmental impact of using coal and enhancing energy security in many regions where it's already available. If you follow the link shown here, you'll be able to get access to information on our activities and that of each of our partners. 
areas of interest and expertise. As you'll see, to date, there are nearly 100 organisations from 21 countries steadily. It will be a pleasure to welcome you on board. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found it of interest. If you have any, have any questions, I'd be happy to answer, try and answer them now. Otherwise, email me later. So we'll just see if any questions have come in. Yep, we have some questions here. Uh, is Turkey's lignite too low CV, et cetera, fairly? Yeah, it, it depends on the source. Some, some of the, um, the Turkish lignites are, are fairly low CV and really do need upgrading for, for use in a sort of more advanced power plant, but some of it's um, reasonably good, condi uh, reasonably good um, uh, characteristics and high enough, certainly for, for sort of conventional systems. Yeah, so again, it depends where you are. Um, increasingly, Turkey has been washing its lignite as well, so it's been upgraded in that sense. So that, that, that's an added bonus. There are, there are a couple more questions here that will be easier for me to do, uh, respond directly to, but uh, there's another one here. Um, you mentioned some of the bigger potential markets. Who are, who are some of the more modest ones you consider to have good market potential? Well, in the report, for convenience sake, uh, the countries I looked at were broken up into four groups, depending on the scale of their possible uptake of helis, uh, heli technologies. Um, as I mentioned, China and India are obviously the biggest. But there are quite a few smaller, at least compared to China and India, that could still be quite significant. Um, so in the report, the second largest group covers potential markets of between 10 and 45 gigawatts. I, I talked about a couple of these in the webinars with Turkey, where we're looking at somewhere between 37 and 45 gigawatts, and Pakistan, where we're probably looking at around 10. But there are also some quite interesting possibilities in countries such as Bangladesh and so on, and uh, we, we mentioned a few of those. Even if there's a, some uncertainty in some cases, and the pandemic really hasn't helped in this respect, if you add them all up, it comes to quite a lot. But of course, not, not all of the projects proposed in countries such as these are going to go ahead without some challenges. Um, obviously, projects often face varying degrees of local and international opposition on environmental grounds, and, and in some cases, I mentioned funding is also becoming a serious issue. And of course, there are other impacts resulting from the pandemic, some of which we're probably not going to know the outcome of for some considerable time. But even if all of the individual projects flagged up in the report don't go ahead, many will. And it's good that many of these intend to be either supercritical or ultra supercritical plants, so they'll be much cleaner and more effective than plants based on, on older subcritical systems. Uh, of course, what's currently going on in the world, the with what's going on, the overall uh, numbers are quite likely to continue changing, but there's still significant market possibilities in a surprising number of countries, not just the bigger ones that we're already familiar with. Uh, do you really think there's a good market potential for the type of small capacity plants that you talked about? Well, yes, I do actually, yeah. There appear to be a number of areas where smaller plants would be a better fit than a large one. Um, and I mentioned some of the reasons behind this thinking. Heli technologies have now been developed to the point where they can be clean and very efficient, much more so than older systems and not just at large capacity. I feel there could be quite a market for this type of plant in various parts of the world. I think it'll be particularly interesting to follow the project that's being developed in Indonesia that I mentioned. This is the 315 megawatt USC project at the, uh, the Lontar power plant. Uh, this is using Japanese technology from IHI and um, Toshiba of, J of Japan. And so far, there's every reason to think this will reach a successful outcome. I, I could see that finding applica applications at that sort of scale elsewhere in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, <laughs> In, in, to summarise, yes, I do think there are, there are potential markets out there. 
uh, one here, how successful have the Chinese constructed power stations been? Have there been any failures? I, th I, th I think it's true to say some of the earlier ones uh, face problems, although more recent ones, they certainly seem to be working quite well. When uh, cl clearly, any, any power station can have a, a failure of some description, but certainly the more recent Chinese ones don't seem to be causing too many problems elsewhere. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the next bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I, so, sorry, yeah. What are the costs of add-ons like carbon removal technology? Would it add greatly to the cost of coal producing electricity? That's a very sensible question and one that's very relevant today. Um, the, the cost can sort of have, not just the capital cost, but they can be fairly considerable. But the uh, the technology now is, is moving forward in quite a quite a variety of ways. Um, technology developers have, have spent the last decade really trying to bring down the price and increase the efficiency of, of carbon capture systems, and it's made a lot of progress. But it clearly, in most cases, it will impose an energy penalty on the on the power plant, which will obviously push up prices and operating costs and also um, drain some of, some of the power away from it. So there are knock-on effects. The, it's, it's true to say at the moment there, the, the technology is, is, is there, and it's very effect, it can be very effective on coal-fired power plants. But really, it, depending again on the power plant uh, we're talking about, if we're looking at an older unit, say an old subcritical one, then the costs of upgrading something like that and fitting it with carbon capture are likely to be extra. Uh, well, too high essentially to proceed. But um, with with newer heli-based plants, for instance, which in, in fact some cases some of these are being built now with, with what termed with what's termed capture-ready technology. Um, so you know that's that's where the real market lies. I think with modern plants fitted with CO2 capture rather than older ones. Although there are uh, some older ones that are still suitable for upgrading, but I think the, rank, the main market really is, is, is going to be with newer units. Uh, someone's just asked about what about ammonia firing along with coal? That, that's a very interesting question um, and one that's not, that there's not too much information in the public domain about this at the moment, although um, there's work going on, as you probably know, there's work going on in Japan which is looking at uh, coal firing ammonia with coal. Um, I think that'll be one to follow in the future. It's an interesting concept and it certainly, if it works, has potential elsewhere, I think. But as I say, at the moment, it's, in a, it's an early stage of uh, development and really there, the, there isn't much information in the public domain, but it will be certainly one to look back at it in six months or so and see how it's doing. Well, that's the end of the questions. There's a couple there that I'll respond to directly afterwards. Uh, but that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much for your uh, Thank you, interest. Steve. Well, your, <laughs> your concentration. Thank you. Thank you very much. All that remains for me to say is uh, the report on this topic will be published by next month. And um, the slides from this webinar will be available to download from our webinar page on our website shortly. Next webinar from us will be on Wednesday, the 16th of December, um, on reducing emissions in China, and will be presented by Deborah Adams. Thank you all for joining us today, and goodbye. <laughs>